Good evening. We welcome you to our evening service. This morning we uh, began live streaming. I talked to Norma Inman a few minutes ago and she said she was able to enjoy the morning worship service even though she and Jerry are confined at home. So that was, uh, that's wonderful what technology can do. If you're visiting with us tonight, we are certainly glad to have you here. Our theme for the year is shown on the screen. Uh, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? We would, it, wouldn't it be wonderful if our hearts were on fire for the Lord, not only this year, but for the rest of our lives? In our uh, services tonight, uh, Brother Bo Gross will be leading singing. Brother Brandon Elliott has the opening prayer. Cole Swinney, the scripture reading. Brother Pollock is going to begin uh, speaking from Ruth tonight. And then uh, Brother Jeremy Jones has the announcements, and Max Mooney has the closing prayer. Uh, Sister Michelle Holcomb called me this afternoon. She fell this morning as she was coming out of her apartment on the way to, to worship service, and uh, Chris had to take her by the hospital. Uh, she has, uh, is okay, bruised up, but is at home and ask that we remember her in prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Our loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we can assemble tonight to worship Thee, and we pray that all that we do is pleasing in Your sight. We pray, Father, that You would be with Sister Michelle Holcomb and, and help her to have a quick recovery from her fall. We love You, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Number 308, 308, it's all the same. In vain did I implore me, my soul burned.
come to you this time so very thankful for this day so very thankful for uh, our lives and all that you do for us all the many blessings that we receive from you we take so much for granted father and we are very thankful for those things thank you for providing for us all our needs thankful father for the rain that we've had this week and I uh, just pray you would continue to be with us Father, we thank you for this congregation here at Boonville, and we and I just pray that everything that we do here will be pleasing to you. Everything that we do uh, will will uh, we'll be able to reach out and uh, to help others to grow your kingdom, Father. We have many here at Boonville who are sick and need our prayers, and we just ask you to be with each of them, all those uh, on our sick list, and. Those who are, are sick and hurting, we just ask you to, to be with those. Pray, Father, for uh, the leaders of our congregation. You would uh, give them wisdom, give them strength. Pray, Father, for our country that we live in. We ask you, Lord, to, uh, to continue to bless us as a nation. We ask your, your blessings, and we pray, Father, that the things that the decisions that are made will benefit us as Christians. Father, we thank you for your love for us so much that you sent your only son. We're so thankful that you sent Jesus to this earth. We pray that you would uh, be with us throughout the rest of this service. Pray you continue to be with Bo as he leads us in singing. Pray that we would sing out and, and praise you, Father, and pray that you would be with Greg as he brings the lesson to us, that we would listen. We would put off the things of the world just for a little while and uh, listen to his words, which come from your word, Father. Forgive us for our many sins. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to mark the invitation song, be number 911. 911. Psalm before our scripture reading this evening, number 679, 679. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, trust in
I'll be reading this evening from Ruth, chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. I'll be reading from King James Version. Ruth, chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back into her people, and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left, speaking unto her. Good evening. Keep your Bibles turned there to the book of Ruth as we will be studying there in just a uh, few moments. Appreciate so much for your participation in our worship service tonight as well as this morning. Uh, as I mentioned in the bulletin article, if you read that last week, I do want to begin a, uh, a study on Sunday nights, particularly in the book of Ruth. Uh, most of you know that Ruth, Esther, and Job are the books uh, that our young folks are studying for Bible Bowl as well as Bible Trivia and in an attempt to help them uh, in that study as well as uh, give us some information about those books. I want us to, to look at some passages from those books in the upcoming weeks. The book of Ruth uh, is an amazing story. Uh, it is written in narrative. Uh, matter of fact, much of the Bible is written in narrative and I, I, I love that, um, that genre. I love that part of the Bible. Uh, Ruth is important in a lot of different ways uh, from a, a holistic perspective. Uh, it has, of course, this narrative of a love story that we're going to go through, but also uh, has some important genealogy. Uh, Ruth is there to help us understand uh, the lineage of Jesus Christ and how important that is to us. According to verse 1, um, the story takes place in the period of the Judges. Uh, if you'll remember, the period of the Judges was a very dark and chaotic period. It was a very bleak time in Israel's history. During this time, uh, Israel wasn't really much more than kind of a loose confederacy of, of tribes, of groups uh, that really struggled to agree on anything. There was strife within, there was strife without. Their political instability was a product of their spiritual rebellion. If you remember in the book of Judges, there was a very visual cycle there of disobedience, of punishment or disaster, of suffering, of them crying out to God, God sending a judge to rescue them, them being obedient for a while and then disobedient again. And that, that went on time and time again. Well, the book of Ruth is set during this particular time. Now, as far as the writing goes, the author and the date is not exactly known. A lot of different... Uh, speculation about when it might have been, but it's primarily about this young lady named Ruth, her mother-in-law Naomi, and a man that we're going to meet later called Boaz. Ruth was from Moab, which was located on the uh, side of the Dead Sea, east side of the Dead Sea. Uh, the Moabites were descendants from Lot. Their language was very similar to Hebrew, and the book records how that Elimelech uh, and Naomi travel into Moab with their sons, and then Naomi and Ruth travel back to the land of Israel. When you think about the book of Ruth as a whole, you see the way that God demonstrates His love and faithfulness to us and His desire for us uh, to live the life that He wants us to, the way, the way He works even behind the scenes sometimes to make things happen for His good. It shows the difference between what happens when a nation does not follow in obedience to the covenant of God, such as in the book of Judges, and what happens when God's people actually follow in faithfulness with the covenant, and we see that more in Ruth. And so during this, this chaotic time of the time of the Judges, we have Ruth, and the story of Ruth provides us with a glimpse of hope, hope for the future and what is to come. When you look at Ruth chapter 1, you see a lot about decisions. You see... One decision affecting another decision. And you see that because this decision was made, another decision has to be made. And so as I begin to study and look through this, this is what stuck out to me. And that's going to kind of uh, outline our chapter tonight as we think about the different decisions that were made and the effect that it has upon the story. We begin with the first five verses 
And we see the decision of Elimelech and, and how that kind of sets the, the setting for the story. The Bible says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife Naomi. The names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Epaphrites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Kilion died, so that the women, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Now these first five verses are packed full of a lot of different things. A lot of different uh, ideas that, that set the stage for the rest of the story. The first of these is famine. The reason for the move, the reason they left Israel was because of a famine that came upon the land. Famine was a terrible reality in ancient times. We read of them throughout scripture. We read of them throughout other uh, historical books. Uh, famine was something that happened. Bethlehem in particular was especially uh, prone to drought and famine because of the lack of the fresh water around, the, the springs and some of that. It, it didn't have that like other regions had. Farming in the region was difficult because uh, just a, a bad harvest or two could really ruin a family dependent on agriculture. Well, this is the reason God says, the Bible says, for the move. There was a famine. Uh, there wasn't... Um, there wasn't things growing, there wasn't things uh, to eat, there were, there were, the situation was terrible. And so in order to survive, this man named Elimelech goes into a new home in a strange land, leaving Bethlehem and, and traveling to Moab. You can see there on the screen uh, where that would be. Uh, Bethlehem there on the left, the northwest of the Dead Sea. And you can see where they would have traveled over and then down into what is Moab. This would have been the trek they would have made, and then, of course, eventually when Naomi comes back, the trip they would have made back to Israel. Moab, in contrast to Bethlehem, for whatever reason, enjoyed significantly more rainfall and fertile soil. Uh, that, they, it, that's why he went there. Uh, it was a place that was better. He was looking out for his family, and so he travels there. Now, we're not told the reason for the famine. Matter of fact, in the book of Ruth, there's a lot of unanswered questions. There's a lot of questions that if you're a student of the Bible, you go through and you look at this, and you go, well, I wonder about this, and I wonder why God did this, and I wonder why Naomi... Well, well there's a lot of wondering in the book of Ruth. Uh, we don't, we're not told all the answers to the questions. The, the writer here, the narrator, often just gives us what happens without a lot of detail, without a lot of commentary. Not whether God approved or disapproved, not whether it was a good thing or bad thing, just that it, that it happened. So we're not told the reason for the famine. Uh, sometimes God caused famines and sometimes he did not. Some say that because Israel was in spiritual rebellion at this time, it might have been a punishment. Again, we don't know that for sure. That doesn't seem important to the narrator. It's just the backdrop of what God is about to do. Along with that, there's really given no judgment on Elimelech's decision to move. Just an obser observation. Should he have stayed where he was in Israel with his people? Maybe so. Should he have moved in order to take care of his family? Maybe so. Again, no judgment is given. Uh, we're not told... Uh, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, it's just setting up the scene for the things to come. Now, it is interesting that the Bible says that they went to sojourn in the country of Moab. Sojourn, in a lot of context, means to visit. So in that, in that vein, we would think that the plan all along was to go there for a little while and then come home. The difficulty is there are plenty of other contexts and when this same word has to, has to deal more with permanence. So that doesn't help us out a whole lot either. It's also used to mean they were going to stay a long time. Whatever the case is, because of the famine, they went to the land of Moab. The second thing we notice here in this chapter with Elimelech and specifically Elimelech's decisions is that of family. We are introduced to his family, his wife Naomi, his two sons, Malon and Kilion. They were from Bethlehem in Judah. They were Epaphrites, uh, probably meaning they belonged to a well-to-do or a respected family. Uh, 
it, it seems that way. But what we do know is they had these two sons, Malon and Kilion, and when they were in Moab, they married two women from Moab. One's name was Orpah, the other's name was Ruth. And that's where we are introduced to these, uh, to these ladies. Well, the next thing that we immediately notice with Elimelech's decision was that of funerals. The first few verses here are a lot about funerals. First of all, Elimelech died. Elimelech died, and, and again, we're not told why. Uh, after about 10 years, Malon and Kilion died. Again, we're not told why. We're not told uh, how it happened. Uh, the narrator isn't concerned with the why, just that they died. Well, what this does, though, is it leaves Naomi as a grief-stricken, sympathetic figure. It leaves a woman that went into Moab with her husband and two sons. While she was there, had a husband, two sons, two daughters-in-law. But now, but now her husband has died. And then after 10 years and no children, no grandchildren for her, her husbands die as well. A woman left with no husband and no sons. Now it's interesting that in verse 5, it may have been that she lost her name as well. Both Malon and Kilion died so that she's referred to here as the generic, the woman. The woman. Understand that in this society, Naomi was at the bottom. Naomi had lost everything there was to lose. She was in a foreign country. She was a woman without a husband and without any sons. What had started out as happiness and security ended up with three graves and three widows, unable to pick up the pieces of their lives because some of those lives were now missing. Also in verse 5, there's this Hebrew term that has reference to being a woman just left over. That's how Naomi felt. Well, as we, as we think about those things, let's, let's stop for a moment, think about some things to consider, some things for us to think about from these first few verses in Elimelech's decisions. First of all, we realize that sometimes bad things happen to God's people. The path isn't always an easy one. Sometimes bad things happen. This first few verses are heartbreaking. They're sad, they're tragic, that a family would have to go through this. Secondly, we realize that God is not to blame when bad things happen. Now, sometimes God causes things to happen, but sometimes God simply allows things to happen. And often we get caught up on the why. Well, why did this happen? Whose fault is it? Who caused this? What did they do to make this happen? And in reality, sometimes bad things just happen. We should not dwell on the why, but instead on the what now. Instead of getting so caught up and consumed on the why and spending all of our energy on that, perhaps, like Naomi eventually gets to, we say, well, what now? Because of what has happened, for good or for bad, because of what I'm experiencing now, how do I react to that? What now? I think these verses illustrate that sometimes we need to have faith under fire. Here's a woman of God that is experiencing all sorts of things thrown her way. Curveball after curveball after curveball. Tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. And again, we ask those questions. Did Elimelech make the right decision? Was it, was it, you know, in hindsight, should he have done what he did? Should he have stayed? How did they find themselves in this no-win situation? What do we do when we, we're faced with decisions? I mean, if you were Elimelech, what would you have done? Oh, well, I, I, I would have stayed there and I would have stayed in, in Israel and I would, have, I would have trusted God. Was that the right decision? Maybe it was. Or, you know, the Bible talks about taking care of your own and providing for your household. Elimelech said, my family's got to eat. I know they can eat over there. And so he picked them up and, and moved. Sometimes we find ourselves in what we consider no-win situations. What we have to do is choose the option, choose the path that is most consistent with complete trust and dependence and faith in Him. But I think also what we're going to find in this story is that God can work for good even through difficult circumstances. 
the, the, the writer is setting up the story for us and letting us understand just how terrible things look for Naomi. But we're going to find that eventually through Naomi, through her influence and through Ruth, he will provide salvation for the world. I think we have to acknowledge here that sometimes we have problems. Someone has said that there are three kinds of people. There are people that are having problems, those that are getting over problems, and those that are getting ready to have problems. The fact is we have trials. We have tribulation. We have difficulty. Bad things happen. We have to react with faith and submission. We have to react with trust in God and God alone. Well, that's, that's what's happening with Elimelech. So we find these funerals and Naomi is left distraught. Beginning in verse 6, we read about some of the decisions now that Naomi makes. She arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me, for your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. With Naomi, Naomi, we have a decision about the country in which she now dwells. Naomi found herself in a foreign country. She found herself away from her people. She found herself alone as she had no husband and no sons. And so she makes a decision, I'm going to go back. She had heard in the, in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited those of the people of Israel, and so she makes a decision to go back. But she also shows concern for her daughters-in-law. She knew there was nothing for her in Moab. She knew that as a foreigner in the land of Moab, there would not be much that she could do. And so she makes the decision to go home, wants to go back to the land of Judah. So she tells her daughters-in-law, you stay. You stay in Moab. This is your country. These are your people. And specifically, she says, you stay here so that you can remarry. You stay here so that you can have husbands and have children. You stay here because this is what, this is what you need to do. And she, she wants the Lord to deal kindly with them. The Hebrew word here is hesed. You've heard me talk about that before. This uh, this loving kindness, this kindness that, that she wants God to have upon them. Even though she felt like God was unkind to her, she says, this is what's important for you. And so you see Ruth in a, in a very real way looking out for these two young ladies. And, and she says, look, I've made the decision. There's nothing for me here. I'm going to go back, but you stay here. You stay here. You go back to your, your father's house. You, you go back and, and you hope that someone else will ask to marry you. And you can have children and all of that. And, and, and the, the, the young ladies say, no, no, no. We're going to go with you. She says, why? What good would it do? I, I don't have anything to offer. You need to stay here. Concern in a country. When we think about things to consider from these verses, think about this. Naomi believe that the Lord was against her. She, she begins to reveal, uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of going down two paths. On the one hand, she acknowledges uh, the way God has helped in the past and the kindness, but on the other hand, she sees him as working against her. She believes that the Lord is against her, but he isn't. He, he's already working to heal her broken heart. You know, sometimes we believe that God is against us when he's not. 
Sometimes we look at our situations and in our life and we say, well, well, God is doing this to me. God is angry with me. And, and really, he's not. We don't understand the big picture. We, we don't see things as God sees things. But we also he, see here that sometimes making one decision forces other decisions. Because of the decision that they made to go at Moab, now Naomi looks at the situation around her and says, okay, this is where I am. This is, this, for, for whatever reason, how I got here, good or bad, this is where I am now, and I have to make more decisions. Isn't that true for us today as well? For whatever reason, we look back in our lives, and, and, and maybe it's good decisions, maybe it's bad decisions, maybe it's circumstances beyond our control, but the fact of the matter is, we're in the present. We're here. And so we have to decide, what am I going to do with what I've been dealt? Do I like the hand I've been dealt? Maybe not. But that's what I have. And so how am I going to react to that? What am I going to do with that? You see, when faced with tough times, we often have to make those tough decisions. And so Naomi has made the decision. She's going back. And then we have the decision of the two daughters-in-law. Verse 14, they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. We have, we have Orpah. We don't know a lot about her uh, other than what we find out here in this story. We know that when it comes to her decisions, it seems that she had a very close relationship with her mother-in-law. Been there 10 years. They knew each other. In bo both verses 9 and 14, there was weeping. There was weeping. A, a closeness there of the family. Naomi, Naomi insisted that she stay. There was, there was worrying. There was worrying about Naomi. When Naomi first said, look, I want you to stay, both of the girls said, oh, no, 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 we're not going to let you be alone. You're our mother-in-law. We care for you. We worry about you. We're going to go with you. But when Naomi insisted... And by the way, she made a very good argument. She made a very good argument. When Naomi insisted, Oprah decided, Orpah decided to stay. Now, we look at that, and we see Ruth elevated as kind of the, the, the hero of the story. But Orpah didn't necessarily do anything bad. She made a decision, and it was a decision actually that in the circumstances was a very good decision. When we think about things to consider, given the options available, this was the most reasonable and the best alternative to her. See, here the choice wasn't really between right and wrong, but between better and best. Orpah decided one way, Ruth decided another. Sometimes, sometimes we make a good decision, and sometimes we make a better decision. So with Orpah, we have this this relationship with Naomi and this worrying about her. But when Naomi says, no, you need to stay here, she says, okay, that's what I'm going to do. But of course, with Ruth, it's not that way. Ruth says in verse 16, Do not urge me to leave you or return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, as more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. This is the heart of the story, right? This is the part of chapter 1 that we remember. By the way, this is where the theme verse for Last Leaders comes this year. Is this decision of Ruth that said, I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to go with you. I am going to be one with you. And so when it comes to the decisions of Ruth, we first have this, this idea of departing. Ruth says in verse 16, I've decided to depart as well. Where you go, I'm going to go. Now understand, Naomi had come from a different land into a foreign land of Moab. Now Ruth, now Ruth is going to leave her home, her family, her culture, her religion, all of those things, and she's going to go into a new land, a departure. She says, I'm going to depart. I'm going to stay with you. Where you go, where you go, Naomi, I will go. 
dwell. She says, I'm going to dwell with you. Where you lodge, I will lodge. You're not getting rid of me, Naomi. My sister made her decision. I've made mine. I am going to dwell with you. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Verse 16. And then you have dependence. Your people. Your people shall be my people. I'm, I'm going in with you, Naomi. Um, mobility was limited in ancient time. Immigration was not common. An immigrant widow was going to have a difficult task. As hard as it would have been for Naomi to stay in Moab is as hard as it would be for Ruth to stay in the land of Judah. But she says, I'm dependent upon you and your people. Do I know your people? No. But your people will be my people. And then there's denial. By denial, I mean Ruth decides to deny the gods of Moab and is willing to become a servant of the Lord. Your God, Naomi, will be my God. I'm denying the gods of Moab. I'm denying my country. Your God, my God. Your God, my God. And then verse 17, there's death. I'm not in this just for a little while, Naomi. I'm in it for the long haul. Where you die, I will die. And where and there I will be buried. People of ancient time, much like in today's time, would want to be buried in the family cemetery. Ruth was willing to give this up. She says, I'm going and I'm not planning on coming back. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Naomi, I am with you. I am loyal to you, even to death. And then there's determination. She says, may the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. This was a sort of a vow. It's found in varying forms about 11 other places in the Old Testament, where Ruth says, look, I'm in this. I'm determined to stay with you. Well, when we think about the things to consider from this, I want you to think about the great example that we have here of Ruth. I want you to think about all the different things that she was saying and how important it was. And of course, we know the rest of the story. We know some of the things that are going to happen. But here you have a, a young widow with an opportunity to stay there in her own home or go back to her home, stay there in her own country, perhaps have another man marry her and bear children. But she is loyal to this mother-in-law named Naomi. So much so that she says, I'm willing to give up everything to follow you. Oh, what a great example of loyalty and love. And it'd be great to have friends and family like that today. People that are so committed to one another and so concerned for one another. Ruth is, is used as an example here in, in the last leaders deal about being a servant. The, the idea of, of doing what we can for other people and, and Ruth serving Naomi in this way and saying, I'm going to go with you no matter what. No matter what. A great example. Great example of, of loyalty. Well, then finally, the last few verses, we have the results of these decisions. So two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. When they get back into town, there's astonishment. Verse 19 says that the whole town was stirred because of them. You see, they hadn't seen Naomi in at least 10 years. They may or may not have known all that had gone on in those 10 years. But now they find a, a, a lady coming back, an older lady, with a daughter-in-law, a foreigner, a stranger. Someone who was not able to, to have children in the 10 years that she was married to that son. 
it says the whole town was stirred and they begin to ask, is this Naomi? You know, the one that left with her husband and son so many years ago. And then you see in 2021, anguish. Naomi says, call me bitter. Now her name meant pleasant, but she said, I'm not pleasant. Call me bitter. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. He brought calamity on me. Naomi is having a difficult time coming to grips with all that has happened over the last decade or so. She remembers the time that she left this land with her, her husband and her two sons and the joy that they had. Difficult time because of the famine, but, but going for a fresh start. And she says, now, now I'm empty. The Lord has dealt bitterly with me. You see, in a case like this, a widow typically had three options. Number one, she could go back to her parents. It's likely, as Naomi describes herself as an older woman, that her parents were already dead by this time, so that wouldn't be a very good option. A second option was to remarry. But if she is an older lady, and uh, theoretically beyond the age of childbearing, uh, she would not be considered uh, marriage material by most of the men around. And the third thing was to work. And again, her being an older lady, that would be difficult. So we can understand why Naomi felt like the rug had been pulled out from under her. We can understand why she felt like that the Lord had, had dealt bitterly with her and had made her empty. Of course, what, we, what she doesn't know yet is the way that God is going to use this situation to do great things in the kingdom of God. And so finally we have in verse 22 that anticipation. The narrator kind of sets us up for what's coming next. And again... You know, as we've said before, chapters were put in here by, by man. This story would have been read as a whole. But there's a break point here, and the narrator kind of reminds us, you know, they've come from Moab, they've come to Bethlehem, and they're here at the beginning of barley harvest. In chapter 2, we're going to find out why that's so important. Naomi's life was a famine of disappointment, but God was about to bring about a harvest of blessings. As you think about these particular things and the story as a whole, Remember that when we feel empty and forsaken, when we feel like things are taking away from us, that there is hope. There's hope for something more. I know when you're stuck in it, when you're at the bottom of the barrel, it doesn't seem like that's going to happen. We've all been there to a certain degree in some way or another. Naomi felt like she was at the bottom of the bottom, but God was going to use her and use her story to do great things. I think we learned from this story that we need people to help us through difficult times. Oh, how the church would be different and how the world would be different if we had more roots in the world today. If we had people who were, who were willing to have that kind of loyalty and that love and that dedication to people. See, Naomi felt alone, but she had Ruth. I think at this particular time in the story, Naomi didn't realize all that she had. She was looking at all the bleak, all the negative, all the terrible, and she didn't realize how great it was to have someone like Ruth in her life. Perhaps you're overlooking someone tonight. Perhaps in our, uh, our observation of what's going on in our lives, we forget the people that are there for us. You know, it's often when tragedy happens, when we, when we lose something important to us, something special to us, that we're reminded as our friends and family surround us just how many people in our lives care for us. Naomi felt alone, but she had Ruth. Naomi felt that God was against her. But he visited his people in Judah, and he brought Naomi home. And as we end chapter 1, we know that the story is not over. God is not done with Naomi yet. I want you to realize tonight that God's not done with you yet either. There is still more to write. There is still more to do. We have to put our faith and our confidence in God and say, God, use me the way you will. Use me to make me better. Use me to influence others around me. Use me, God, to give you honor and glory in everything that I do. Naomi went through a lot. We're introduced to Ruth here, and from these two ladies, we're going to learn so much. I don't know with whom you identify in this story, you may be here tonight, and as we, we read through this story, you really identified with Naomi. 
Perhaps you feel beat down like God is working against you, like the world is working against you. If, if you find yourself there tonight, may I encourage you to look up, look out, and look around, and realize that there is hope, and realize that there are a lot of roosts sitting around you, beside you, in this town, in this church. That there are a lot of people there that want to encourage you and want to help you. I hope that all of us, at least to some point tonight, can identify with Ruth. But I hope we will do more than identify with her. I, I hope that we will look at her attitude and her loyalty, her example, and be Ruth for people in their lives. Be the one that says, I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to stick with you. We're in this together. You do not have to go through this alone. I'm here to help. God has promised not to take away the storms, but he's promised to get us through the storms. And I think the story of Ruth is a good example of that. Tonight, if you're here and you're not a child of God, please, please consider that carefully. Understand the importance of that decision and how God wants you to be one of his, how he invites you to be his child, how he pleads with you to submit yourself to him through baptism, to put off that old man, to take on the new, to have those sins washed away, to become one of his. If you're here tonight and you've, you've let Satan take over, get control, make tonight the night that you send him packing, that you say, I'm, I'm back with you, God. I'm, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to follow you completely. If we can assist you tonight in any way, please come as we stand and as we sing together. Bring Christ your broken life.
Once again, we'd like to welcome you to the Boonville Church, and if you're visiting with us, we're so thankful that you've joined us tonight. Uh, stick around, give us a chance to uh, get to know you. Uh, got a few announcements that we do need to repeat again tonight. We need to pray for Nellie Ashby, who had surgery and is currently in the ICU. This is the, the mother of John Ashby. Also, we need to remember Michelle Holcomb, uh, as Brother Jim mentioned earlier. Also, we want to remember three that have been baptized at the Justice Center on Friday, uh, Robert Settles, Solomon Hines, and Michael Ties. Uh, our next time that we'll be joining together is on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. We encourage you to come back and, and meet us again. And if you would look on the back of your order of worship, there's several things that are due now. CYC, deposit of 35. Uh, the gospel meeting this week is Snowdown is uh, through Wednesday. Do we have a bus that will be going out? We will not have a bus that will be going out to that this week. Also, for our youth, timeout is on Tuesday from 6.30 to 7.30 in the Little Chapel. And uh, our ladies, there's a, uh, the North Mississippi Ladies Retreat this coming weekend uh, that Sandra Foster will be speaking at. Uh, that's all the announcements I have. If you have not had the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper, you may pass into the Little Chapel at this time. Psalm for our closing prayer, number 753. 753. Will you please stand and remain standing for the closing prayer? <clears throat> Tempted and tried. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all the blessings you've blessed us with. Thank you for this weather that we've had. Dear Lord, thank you for this country that we have. We're free to worship you. And please be with our country, Lord, during this time of election. And Lord, please be with the sick of our number and those who are in mourning. And Lord, please go with us throughout this week. Forgive us when we do wrong. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.